the name of my book is The Art is the Cloth. It comes out of a long period of time when I've been thinking about the ways in which tapestries, not all tapestries, can reflect upon what they are, which is a piece of cloth. It began, it was inspired by a fax I got from Helena Hernmark in the early 1990s when I was writing an article about her. She sent me a fax which said, the art is the cloth. And out of that have come several lectures that I've given, the exhibition that Rebecca talked about, and now this book. The exhibition had 60 pieces from Canada, Mexico, and the United States. The book has over 300 pieces. They come from all over the world. So what I'm going to try to do today, because Rebecca has explained to me that the course she is working with is a design course, is to talk about the design elements in the pieces that I'm going to show you. And, as, and each of those pieces is in its proper place within the book, subject matters, topic areas, but it doesn't say that if I show you something, it is the only place that that piece could go. Many of the pieces could go in several categories. The first area is the elements of weaving. That is, what is it that tells us that something is woven when we look at it? The elements of weaving remind us that what we're looking at is a piece of cloth. This piece by Joanne Soroka, who lives in Edinburgh, is, is a piece in which you see what is woven very, very clearly is the ground color, which is tan, and then the structure of over and under on those uprights of gold, there are five of those, and those cross pieces of gold, and there are five of those. And then there are those additional pieces, which look like little bits of weaving all over that structure, most of them being white and gold, as well as that very sneaky little bit at the bottom, which is red, which gives us something to work against as we look at the whole of it. Joanna has been very clear about the fact that this is a piece that was made in one piece. She did not add anything later. She did not embellish with anything after she had completed the weaving of it. The next area to think about is special materials. And that is materials that people use to weave what they want to weave. Materials often invite people to think about what it is that they're seeing, what it is that tells them that this is something not like paint, not like anything else, but just tech tactile. And in this particular piece by Juja Pirelli, Poor Angel, huge piece, as you see, eight feet, eight inches by five feet, five inches. It includes wool, silk, silver thread cord coins. The coins are from Eastern Europe during the socialist period when every country had their own currency and no currency could be transferred or exchanged for the hard currencies of Western European countries. And what you see in the close-up is the way in which Pirelli's work emphasizes, again, the textile quality with all of that warp that we can see, all of those hanging threads, and all of those coins almost looking like chain mail, as though this was something, this was a figure that needed to be protected. In addition to which, a friend of mine pointed out that the way that the angel's head rests on one wing looks vaguely like the images that one might see of Jesus Christ so that there is a way in which the maker has evoked a lot of different things all in one place. And I don't think it's a bad idea to think of a poor angel as reminding us of a, a religious tradition that was undoubtedly important in a place like Hungary. The next area is visual themes adapting the past to the present. There are a lot of visual themes that show up regularly in tapestry weaving. This is one, it is called a verdure, which means greenery. And this along with other things, people may know this better as meal fleur, but meal fleur and verdure, although they both cover leaves and animals and greenery have different qualities as you look at them. This particular piece has a wonderful quality to it, which is that you have that overall look of stuff everything all closely together. And then when you look at it more closely, you see the leaves and you see all the animals. 
One of my friends at the studios in Paris used to say about things like verdures and meal fleur is that the animals and the leaves had more expression often than any people who were ever included in them. And if you look carefully at these, you will see that all kinds of emotion is being evoked by the way that these animals interact with each other. It's a remarkable decision. But contemporary weavers often weave greenery of different kinds. And here's an example by Kathy Hoffman of Australia, just called the plant tapestry or the leaves. And it's a piece that reminds you of the way that colors can work together, the way that when you look at something in in nature, you see the green leaves and then you see all the colors within the greens. And then as the leaves turn at a season like autumn, you see the reds and the yellows and the browns. And this is a piece that reminds us of what it is that we see around us. It reminds us by having a close up of leaves. And then as you move out from the center of the tapestry where one of the leaves is most prominent, you get into more the sense of looking at things from far away and seeing the way that things work with each other and seeing this really very useful and inspiring combination of colors. You're seeing greens working with reds. Those are complementary colors. And you're seeing pale colors working with dark colors and you're seeing a range of tones and it makes the piece exciting to look at. Then, there's trompe l'oeil, a French expression, which means to fool the eye. And trompe l'oeil is about not being able to tell that what you're looking at is absolutely flat because the three dimensionality of what you're looking at seems much more real than the idea that if you put your hand on it, it would just go very smoothly over the entire surface. Andrzej Reich from Poland was a master at this. This piece, Polontex, shows you something that I am sure looks as though it has got to be three-dimensional. But if you look at the edges, you'll see that it all comes to a flat edge. And so it is about his masterful work with the darks and the lights and the in-between tones that gives you that very, very strong sense of things that have a three-dimensional look without actually being three-dimensional. Tapestry is a system of weaving that always in includes as its basic element a seed, the weft yarn passing in front of the warp yarn. Seeds in tapestry are like pixels in photography. And pixels, as you might guess, are a thing which enable a photograph to have a real three-dimensional potential. And that's what you see in this tapestry where Andre Reich has taken advantage of that three-dimensional potential. Then directionality, which is an idea that I had. I was noticing the way that some pieces almost celebrate the fact that they're woven in the direction in which the warp goes, or that the way that they are woven celebrates something about the way that they have been woven. So I will show you two pieces here. This is the first, Grace Eckert, who now lives in the United States, but lived for many years in England. And it was during that time that she was weaving tapestries. It is called Hyde. And it is a piece woven from bottom to top. And you will see that it shows a constant ground. It shows furniture. It shows stairs. It shows the horizontal of, as it seems, each floor in the house. She was the oldest of six children in a family that grew up in normal Illinois. And she was always wandering around the house she said that she thought her brothers and sisters probably thought she was a little bit nuts, imagining that she could hide out somewhere and nobody would be able to see her. And there is no grace in these images, but there is that sense of going in and out and around and up and down and all of those things. Now I'm gonna stop the slideshow for one second after I point out to you that the very bottom image of all of these images in the house shows you a couch. And you see that yellow couch with the brown frame that it's on. Now, if you look behind me, you will see the couch. This is another piece by Grace Eckert, and it is called Branded. And she told me that that couch had been in her grandmother's house, and it is what she grew up with. 
And so it appears that that couch had real significance when she was working on her pieces. So there's a piece in which going from bottom to top replicates the sense of walking into a house and going up the stairs. You see that she repeats certain patterns. She also includes various details. There are all those ovals of rag rugs. Often there are floors that have the same look or a similar kind of look. It's a very interesting piece. Then you have this piece by Archie Brennan, which was woven from left to right, and which I always find hysterically funny because it is a piece that was woven and you can see the very clever way that it was woven. If you imagine that the left-hand side was the thing at the bottom of the loom, he includes that very little bit of gold to indicate that that first letter is a T. He also has these very formal letters. He has two words that are made each of three letters a piece. He only uses two colors to make it. What is interesting about this piece is twofold. One is that it's conceptual which is that he had this idea, which is you could make anything that you wanted because you're making your own piece of cloth. And what he's done is to play with that and to point out to the viewer that even though you could make this any way you wanted to, it looks as though your ambitions exceeded the warp that you were working on, except that of course, he is the one who chose the warp. It also shows you what extraordinary variety you can get in a piece even only using two colors, in this case, the black and the gold. The next area I talk about in the book is textiles and identities, when textiles define a particular group. And that has to do mostly in the book, though not exclusively, with the Western Hemisphere. So here is an example from Deborah Sparrow, Salish Weaving, working at a loom at the Anthropological Museum in Vancouver, British Columbia. Salish weaving has a particular aesthetic. It has a lot of angles and triangles. It has a limited palette. In some of the traditional Salish weaving, they used dog hair. That was from a dog that they developed for that purpose. That dog has since gone extinct. But what she is doing would be recognizable to anybody who knows about that particular kind of weaving. She and her sister reintroduced Salish weaving a generation after her grandfather as a child had been the last person for whom a piece of Salish weaving had been made. She and her sister decided that it was time to bring Salish weaving back. In these cultures, the weaving is the thing that is one of the identifying markers of the group. So that, as I say, when you see this, you think Salish weaving and that is the point of what she's doing. But then you have pieces like this by Maximo Laura, Harvest Chant. Maximo Laura is a national treasure in Peru and his heritage is that of the Wari, who were a group that existed in the first millennium around an area of Peru called Ayacucho. And you see, if you look from left to right, you will see somebody with a pipe uh, organ followed by somebody in the middle who is beating a drum, followed by somebody on the right who is playing an instrument like a recorder, but which down there is called a kena. What struck me about the construction of this piece, in addition to its delight, is that as per usual, Maximo Laura cares about color and he cares about putting something together in a particular way. It is almost like looking at a jigsaw puzzle so that every component part is clearly outlined and works to make a whole, much as you might make a jigsaw puzzle. It has a, a liveliness to it. And in it, there is about it as well, I think a kind of invitation to say, look where it is that I come from. The Inca succeeded the Wari, if you will. And they took on a number of the textile techniques that the Wari had developed and the Inca developed them further. But there are a lot of weavers around the area of Ayacucho who still perceive themselves as wari rather than anything else. Then self-reference. If you're making a piece of cloth, what happens if the image within the piece of cloth is cloth? And this is Ai Ito from Japan, whose piece is called Looking. And what you have is a sort of piece divided into sections. On the left-hand side, you have a number of men, 
a number of whom are wearing blue jeans, all of whose blue jeans have very distinct markings and personalities. And on the right, you have what seems to me to be a number of schoolgirls who are wearing their school uniform, which is that red and black plaid skirt. I have to say, I like the kid who has the striped stockings. But it is just the idea of people together wearing clothing that invites you in and reminds you that clothing is cloth and this is what Aito is working with. The last section of the book is historical self-reference. And that is about the fact that there are certain historical pieces that do something that people in our time want to do, want to continue to do. In this case, it's I'm showing you Cleopatra because there are a number of weavers who have been in the last, I would say 100 years, been weaving tapestries in which they talk about particular famous individuals from history. And this was a piece that was not only Cleopatra herself at sea, but from a group of tapestries called the story of Cleopatra. And there she is in her boat, surrounded by a, a very interesting border. It is wider on the sides, it is narrower at the top and it is very narrow at the bottom. I saw an exhibition at the Chicago Art Institute, which is where this piece is located, which said that that bottom section, which is very narrow, was a way of inviting somebody into what it was that was going on. So that if you look at it, it is like a window through which you can walk and then you become part of what is going on in the tapestry. You will also see that the embellishment of images in the borders is a way of making a very interesting and lively frame around that sort of desultory look of women lounging in this boat as it is going God knows where with banners flying and things like that. But to either side, other things are going on. Now in our time, Anne Booth, who lives in the United States, is Baha'i and has done a series of pieces about famous Baha'i women. This particular piece, Munihir Kaunaum, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, is one of nine portraits that she's done of Baha'i women who were significant within the Baha'i faith. Uh, Munihir Kaunaum was late 19th and early 20th century. She was from Persia and her memoir was the first such diary that we know of that has lasted to the present time. What is interesting about this is the way that there's a limited palette, but you nonetheless have that interesting stuff going on in the background as though you are being centered on her face under her scarf. There are those gorgeous leaves on the left-hand side, and you have this sense of enormous peace that radiates out from her face. You also, as I said, have this clothing, which Anne Booth has rendered so effectively that might make you think that this is a piece that belongs in self-reference. It's just an idea. But indeed, the, what is going on in the back with those grays that move to white and then back to gray again, almost makes me think of a series of curtains that are telling you that the sun is coming through or that light is showing through. So, that's the way that the book is organized, is to give people an idea of what is going on. But there was one last thing that I had wanted to do in the book, and I did not have the space in which to do it. They tell you, you have 300 images, and so you think, oh, well, I can do this, and I couldn't. And that was to include tapestries which have hands. Ulrika Mokdad made this piece. It's a detail of a larger piece, and it's called The Farewell Hands. And these are these stylized hands that look as though you've just put your hands into some kind of color and then you've laid them down on a piece of cloth. And so you see the detail of hands, but you don't see a perfect rendering of hands because it's more about leaving your mark. And I think that that is a quite remarkable thing and reminds us of the things that we want to be reminded of. So that's what's going on in the book.